So my name is Pastor Brian. Uh, I used to preach a lot here at Convergence. If you're new, you're like, no, nah, I've never really seen you preach. But for the first couple of years, I was preaching uh, primarily, you know, three to four times a month. And uh, man, just missed it. Honestly, being away from it for a while has made me miss it and also reminded me why I didn't like it. Because it's hard, man. When you study the text, the text is gonna study you. And uh, it's convicting. And so I just wanna start by saying I've been personally cut up this week as I study this text. And so my prayer is that, uh, not that you would, um, at the end of the sermon, remember me or even some of the stories I tell, but that these things would serve to be a, uh, a pivotal hook that you remember that today's sermon is about fighting the drift which we all go through, and the only way to truly fight the drift referred to in scripture is through the person and work of Jesus Christ. So I wanna make much of him. And so I'm gonna ask you guys to stand with me. We're gonna read. Hebrews chapter two, verses one through nine, and then we'll jump into the sermon. If you guys would read aloud with me, our church uh, text we use is the ESV. So if you have a Bible or on your phone, we use the ESV, but read aloud with me, starting off in verse one. Therefore, we must pay close attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him for a little while who was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Father, in Jesus' name, we need help. We will drift from you. Help, Lord, hook and anchor us into the person and work of Jesus. May we grow in our identity as sons and daughters of the Most High God today through your text. Lord, do your work through your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You guys may be seated. Things will drift in life. Things will drift. In the past three months, Pastor Jade has a broken collarbone and a broken, what's it called? Metatarsal number five. He's like, don't put that drift on me. But this is the guy who could do American Ninja Warrior like just a couple years ago. He could still do that. I'm not putting that on him. But there's a thing called entropy. Entropy is that everything that's created will reach a peak and at some point it will continue to die or digress, digress. Um, bad news for you guys who are approaching your 40s because at 42 you start to lose your eyesight. And I don't know if those words are really small on the screen up there or in my Bible, but I'm having a hard time seeing them. In the past six months, my eyesight has drastically decreased. It's an effect of the fall your body, your mind, you'll start losing your memory. You, you, you won't heal the way you used to. The older you get, the worse you get, so to speak. It's the bad news. You will drift physically. You will drift mentally. Your mind will digress. There's people who get dementia when they're older. It's not a young man's disease. It's an, it's an older person's disease. Your mind will start to fail you. And so I wanna ask the question, what do you think of, what, what comes to mind in your mind when you think of the word drift? Anybody? 
What do you think of when you think of the word drift? River. A, a car back. Yeah, drifting a car. I thought that we'd get some Fast and the Furious fans in here. Yeah, something just being swept away by the current, right? Whether it's a river, some sort of body water. That's, that's the premise for what drifting, the, the verb drifting means. It's kind of swept away. And so I wanna show you guys a picture of a young man named Aldi Adelang. Everybody say Aldi Adelang. He's got a cool story. He has a grocery store named after him too, apparently. No, no Aldi shoppers, apparently. Um, so Aldi Adelang is a young man, and he uh, was, at the time, in 2018, he was 19 years old. And this picture of this, it's called a fishing trap. It's actually called a rompong. Everybody say rompong. rompong. I'm making you learn these words because I had to learn them. I wanted to like, make sure that everybody else knew them. So this is a rompong. And what a rompong is, it's, a, it's not a fishing boat, but it's basically a fishing trap. It's what they call it, a fishing trap. And what they do is they, in Indonesia, they put these fishing traps like a mile off the coast, and someone will stay on this fishing trap for, for anywhere from a week to like six months, and basically they're harvesting an area where the fish are just coming up, and then someone will come out to the fishing trap uh, to come and get the fish, and they'll take them back and we'll enjoy them, right? But so this guy, Aldi, Adelang, Aldi Adelang, um, he was in this, this fishing trap called a rompong, and this thing's drifted a couple times. So, so before the story starts, this boat already drifted away twice. Um, this boat would have, or I don't wanna call it a boat, this raft trap, rompong. It's attached to an anchor at the bottom of the, the seaboard, the seafloor, and it's already drifted twice. The first time it drifted for a week, and Aldi got uh, picked up by somebody and they brought him back. The next time it was two days. And this third time, the person who owned the raft trap, the, rom, the rompong, said, hey, we're gonna make sure to give you a two-ray radio, just in case, because this thing's got a history of drifting. And so I wanna ask you the question, first and foremost, why did this rompong drift? Why did it drift? It wasn't attached to the anchor. It became dislodged or untethered to the anchor. And so in life, we will experience two kinds of drift in our normal life, our spiritual life. One is natural. If you're a Christian in this world, you will drift because of the course of this world. There's a natural drifting that exists that affects our supernatural ability to be tethered to Jesus. And the other is when we are actually seeking to move away from our target. If, our, if we're tethered to Jesus, we will intentionally go away and pursue other things. Today's sermon's primarily gonna be speaking towards our spiritual drift that just happens by living in this world. Okay, And so in your books, in your ESV, there might be a title at the beginning that says, A Warning Against Neglecting Salvation. That's kind of the premise of Paul's message, or excuse me, not Paul, the writer of Hebrews, who might or might not be Paul, I actually don't think it's Paul after studying this. But whoever the writer of Hebrews is, he's, he's trying to warn the church. They were facing persecution. They were facing um, odds which would have led them to want to drift back towards Judaism. And so the writer here is trying to tell them not to neglect their salvation, not to drift, which leads me to my first point. We need to fight the drift because it will happen. We need to fight the drift because it will happen. So it's not a matter of if it will happen, but when it will happen. And so this message for the church was not just a message like, hey, some of you might drift. It was really a, a reminder that you will drift. And so I wanna be really clear today, in love, to, to speak to those of you today who might be drifting. Those of you who have experienced some spiritual dryness, those of you who may be in a season where you're not enjoying the word or the fellowship of the brethren, this message is for you. This message is for you. And for everyone else who maybe wouldn't raise their hand, through that last description, I wanna let you know that this message is for you too. Because whether it was in your past or it's tomorrow, there will come a day where you will become spiritually dry. There will come a day where you don't wanna read God's word. There'll come a day where your prayer life is whack. There'll come a day where you don't wanna be in part of missional community. 
There'll come a day when you wanna isolate yourself from other believers, so this message is for you. And if you're in here today and you don't know Jesus and you're drifting in the wrong direction, this message is for you as well. So this message is for everyone. We fight the drift. The writer of Hebrews has encouraged them to fight the drift primarily, why? Because it will happen. It will happen if it's not already happening in your life today. So what are the signs that you're drifting, Pastor Brian? Great question. Came up with a slide and some answers I'm gonna show you. These are some signs that you are drifting. These aren't all the signs, but here are some signs that you are drifting. The first is absence. Absence. You don't want to be in community. You, you isolate yourself. All of a sudden, you stop coming around, right? Where did he go? I haven't seen him in a while. He's absent. She always used to be the one at the front, and I, don't, I just don't see her around anymore. Where, where is she? She was posting on GroupMe a lot, and now I, I don't even know if she's, she's muted us. Notifications are off. She's absent. This is Satan's playground. He loves this. He loves this one when we isolate ourselves. The next A is apathy. Best way I can describe is, is this one is you're there, but you're not there. You're there, but you're not there. You're in the room, but you're not part of the, the group. When asked an opinion about a decision, you really don't have a care. It's kind of like when you ask your wife, like, hey, babe, where do you want to eat tonight? I don't care, babe. Right? And then you name all five places, and none of them are sufficient. And then you end up an hour later, or like when you're going through Netflix and you're trying to look for a movie and you realize you've watched all thousand of them already, right? You don't care anymore. You've come to missional community, you're there, but you're not offering anything. Maybe you brought food, but, but you, haven't, you haven't even opened your mouth. Someone's looking for a prayer request and someone's sharing their heart with you and you're just kinda like, man, yeah. Apathy, you're there but you're not there, you really don't care. Lack of passion, just going with the flow. It's the second sign that you're drifting, just going with the flow. The third A is anger. Getting overly frustrated by people, situations. Your level, your level of anger doesn't quite match the level that you should be, fr there's frustrating things that happen in the world, but your level of anger is up here. People and situations, missional community, coming to church on Sunday, causes you displeasure. You hate it. You start hating people, you start resenting the community, you start bad-mouthing the pastors, the church, maybe your wife, maybe your kids. Angry. It's a sign of spiritual drift. And last, which there's many more, but this is just the four I decided to touch on today. The fourth is anxiety. Anxious. The Bible says be anxious for nothing. And yet if we've seen anything in 2020, should we wear a mask? Should we wear a mask? Or will we meet? Why aren't we meeting? All these things have caused people great levels of anxiety. Pastors are leaving the churches at alarming rates. More pastors quit in 2020 than any other year in like the past 100 years, the percentages. Less people are attending church than ever before. Less people are reading their Bibles than ever before. Why? Because they're responding to their anxiousness. They're so worried about perception or tomorrow that they're really not enjoying the moment. They become untethered. They follow the course of this world. So absence, apathy, anger, anxiety. These are signs that you're not tethered to the anchor. These are signs that you're not trusting in Jesus. And I just wanna just tell us, listen, I say this every time I preach, but this is not a message of condemnation, but a call to courage, a call for you to be courageous, right? All these things I just described, describe me. I didn't give him day. 
Maybe it's describing you. Our brother Aldi, the, 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 the trap fisherman, when he, when he started drifting from sea, he had a week's worth of food. So spoiler alert, he got rescued on day 49, okay? But he had a week's worth of food and water. He had a, a little gas generator. You know, it was, it was enough to last him a week. He was out there 49 days. When he became untethered, he was cut off from the supplies. And so he literally had to siphon salt water from his T-shirt. I don't know how you do that. But you know what happens when you drink salt water? It makes you thirstier and it makes you crazy. And somehow he made it six extra weeks by siphoning water through his T-shirt. He ran out of food so he had to use parts of the boat and fashion a spear and, and spear fish and then take other parts of the boat, set them on fire to create a fire. He was, he was literally, his hut was dwindling down. But somehow, he was able to eat and drink. But I wanna encourage us today, if you're not in Jesus, if you're not in Christ, your life will become more difficult, spiritually speaking. Sin will become more appealing. It'll be harder for you to, 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 to get that spiritual manna. You have to resort to extreme measures when you're isolated. Just like drinking salt water will kind of make you crazy, being untethered from Jesus, your mind will start to go. So this is the really bad news, right? We all drift, I'm showing you some signs of what it means to drift. And then looking at the text, we see here, how do we fight the drift? How do we fight the drift? Starting off in verse one, it says, therefore we must, excuse me, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift from it. Now we just got done reading in chapter one the past two weeks of the sermons that Jesus was supreme over angels, Jesus was supreme over everything. We'll read later in this passage that everything is Jesus' footstool. So we must pay close attention to what we have heard about Jesus because Jesus is better than, than our stuff. Jesus is better than our situation. Verse 2a, it says, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. I had to study this one because I, I was like, what did the angels, what message did the angels declare? And we know that they declared the, the, the pronouncement of Jesus at the celebration of his birth, but, but this is actually referring to the Mosaic law. Jews in the early church were very proud that the Mosaic law was given to them by God through angels. And we do not want to diminish the significance of God's holy law, but the perfect law which God gave to Moses for Israel can never save a sinner. But was God's instrument to point us to Jesus, who fulfilled the law on our behalf. The law was meant to expose our sin, but it could never offer forgiveness. Amen? But Christ took the penalty of our sin and our disobedience and redeemed us from the curse of the law. So the, the writer's here saying, listen, we must pay closer attention to Jesus who can save us from the law than the law because they wanted to drift back to the law. Tell us what to do. How can I be made right? Give us the steps. And sad to say, this is us too a lot of times. Give us the three, the three checks in the box. We'll do those to be right with God. And, and the whole law was fulfilled in Jesus. And verse three says, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard. Jesus was the fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies. John the Baptist, who was the, the last prophet before Christ, said, repent, the kingdom of God is here because the king has arrived. The law cannot save you. The law was meant to expose you of your sin and point you to God, and so Jesus is the only true escape for sinners. Jesus is the only true escape for you today from your drift. So 
So my question today is, are you trusting in yourself? Are you trusting in your good deeds? Are you trusting in your obedience to the law? Or are you trusting in Jesus? Now, now, headwise, we would all say, who are believers and have studied doctrine, that we're trusting in Jesus. But practically speaking, the way that we live out our lives, I believe that we drift towards works-based righteousness. That's why you feel condemned many times, because your performance doesn't add up to the expectations. I'm not talking about Holy Spirit conviction. I'm talking about you not obeying the law and then leading to a feeling of, am I saved? Have I done enough? Or if a brother sins against you, we're not, I'm not even sure if he's saved. It's like, dude, he, he's not saved because he's a pretty good dude. He's saved because of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. And so there may be someone in here today who is still under the penalty of the law. You've yet to receive the righteousness of Christ. The law is perfect to point out your transgression and disobedience and therefore offer you a retribution, which is the penalty of your sin. So if you're here today or anyone listening on this message and you've yet to receive the grace and love of the Lord Jesus, you will suffer the full wrath of God. That's what your sin deserves. You will be crushed for all eternity. You will drift into entropy. It'll be a, it'll be a nonstop death for you for all eternity. It's what the Bible calls hell. You can't escape. You can't work your way to God and you can't prove to God how great you are because you're not good enough and your works will never add up. So if you're in here today and you have yet to receive the grace of the Lord Jesus, my call for you today is to repent. To trust in the one that the scripture's pointing to, the only one who can forgive you of your sins. This is my, my call, my cry to you today. Repent, believe in the king, receive righteousness, and your retribution will be grace instead of wrath. Verse four says, while God also bore witnesses by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Listen, God himself bore audible witness to the truth of Christ's messianic role as did our Lord's own life and ministry, so that we might believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing we would have life in his name. Christ's own disciples also bore witness to the testimony and truth of God's word, which was further validated in Acts chapter two at Pentecost, when the hearts of many men were pierced with the shocking truth that the one whom they crucified was both Jesus, Lord, and Jesus Christ. The person and work of Jesus was testified by God the Father and was validated by the prophesied messianic signs, wonders, and miracles that Jesus himself carried out in his life and ministry and which continued and still continues to this day in his church. And in God's grace, this testimony is also displayed in our own lives. We do the, the, the 30 second testimony before Christ, I was this, this, and this. Jesus came for me and now I'm this. This is, a, this is a miracle. This is a miracle, right? This is a miraculous deed of God to take someone from the grave and resurrect them. If this is your story, then God's continuing to validate his own work, just like he was talking about here in verse four. The promises of God are steadfast and sure and they stand secure on the unchangeable and trustworthy character of God. And for this reason, we are exhorted to pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from the truth of the glorious gospel, nor are we swept along by every wind of doctrine. So the emphasis here, guys, the emphasis here, church, how do we fight the drift? How do you fight the drift? You need the word of God preeminent in your life. We were just reading Psalm 119 yesterday. It was like, I'm gonna meditate on your word day and night. 
Do you meditate on his word day and night? I don't. That's why I was cut to the core this week. If I'm gonna remember how to fight the drift, I must know who I am and where I'm going. I must know who God is and what he's done. There is a strong emphasis on the word of God. The reason pastors falter, the reason husbands leave their wives, the reason wives leave their husbands, the reasons why churches divide, the reason why the, the church of Jesus Christ isn't the salt and light of this earth, this is not preeminent, this is not our anchor. These are our instructions, these hold our marriages together, this holds our church together, this instructs us how to be a witness. Jesus said if you're gonna love him, we must do it with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. This is like everything, right? This is experiencing God. And there's, there's an emphasis here in the scripture that we will, we will experience God through the, way, the things we hear, the things we see, we'll pay attention, right? So I just wanna give a personal emphasis. Pay attention to what God's doing and enter into it. God, do you believe God's working in your life? Do you believe he's working through you? Maybe you don't. If that's the case, like you're never, gonna, you're never gonna see God do any good things in your life because you don't even think he's working in your life. If you've been born again, you have the spirit of the living God. The third person of the Trinity exists inside of you. The third person of the Trinity who was present at the moment of creation. The spirit of God who created the heavens and the earth. The spirit of God who created moms and, and reproductive systems. Created your eyeball. He, he does marvelous things. And so I think we just don't experience God because we don't even think he's working in our life. Because we, we don't have a life that depends on him. But guess what? Even on your best day, you know what I'm talking about, that day you wake up, you're in the scriptures, you, you went to the men's group, people prayed over you, man, and then you went to the outreach and you're serving people with Jesus, telling them about Jesus' word and deed, people coming to faith, like people wanna know more. In my ministry, babies are getting saved, like all these good things are happening. Even on your best day, you will still find yourself in a drift. I promise you. None of us are perfect. None of us can stay tethered perfectly, which leads me to our fourth point, our last point. In order for us to truly have this victory of the drift, we need freedom from the drift. We need freedom from the drift. Verses five through nine. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come or which we are speaking it has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting, the, in, and now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him for a little while who was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. This is what we can't neglect. The preeminency, the supremacy, the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. When we understand how great Jesus is, like Peter says, where else would I go, Lord? Why would I wanna to drift to anything else when I have you? And I believe what these verses really encapsulate is that God is awesome and there's nowhere else we can go. The way we fight the drift is by understanding how great God is. Jesus is greater than the angels. All through the scriptures, and we said it earlier, they, they valued the fact that the angels validated the Mosaic law. When you see the angels appear, if an angel showed up here right now and stood on this stage, like I'm imagining like an eight foot tall angel with a sword like glowing or something, 
Like we would all fall flat on our faces because in the Bible, every time an angel showed up, what did people do? They got scared because the very first word out of the angel's mouth was, don't fear. So the angel could read, hey, this is freaking them out a little bit, right? This is freaking them out a little bit. And, and, and the writer here is saying, listen, Jesus is way greater than that. And his word's been revealed in him and through him, and now we have his written word. When's the last time you dropped to your knees when you're reading your scriptures? That's not common. Right, I love the video of the people in like some weird tribal place. I'm not even sure where it is. But they get a box of Bibles and people are freaking out, man. They're like bursting the box open, holding Bibles, <sighs> sniffing the pages, the, the leather bound, or maybe it was even plaid. I don't know what it was. They were so grateful to have the word of God. Dude, I've got like 15 Bibles in my office. That's almost irreverent. Because I have a hard time reading one. And so I don't think we revere this as like, man, we, we, we want something else. Give us the new Jason Statham movie. Give us the new workout. Give us the new Joe Rogan podcast. We, we need to learn more. It's like, dude, this thing's all sufficient. Why don't we revere this? Why don't I revere this? Am I alone here? Does anybody else struggle just, just reading your Bible? Maybe, maybe I should just walk off right now and let someone else come up who actually has a good life in the Word. I struggle reading this thing. I didn't read books till I got saved. That's why Christian, people laugh about Christian hip hop music. Oh, that's not really relevant. Dude, that, that's how the scriptures got poured out to me because I had a hard time reading. And now that I'm going blind, I have a hard time reading. I listen to the word of God every morning on our CBR app, but I'm telling you, it's a struggle. My flesh doesn't, my flesh says I'm good, I don't need that. And after I read it, I'm like, why didn't I read this earlier? I struggled with sin and then later in the day, I'll, I'll go to my scriptures like, this spoke to the very sin that I struggled with. I don't know where I'm at in my notes. I wanna touch base on verse six. It says, it has been testified somewhere. That almost sounds flippant. It's been testified somewhere of these things. And so to, to modern ear, eyes and ears, it seems odd to refer to the scriptures as saying something happened somewhere. However, the writer of Hebrews is just using, using flowery language. A turn of phrase the original readers would have recognized naturally. The audience of this letter are Jewish Christians who are familiar with the Old Testament texts. So this phrasing is a bit like asking a modern day Christian, doesn't the Bible say somewhere that God loved the world so much he sent his son? The somewhere phrasing then is really a reminder of something in scripture which the readers obviously already knew. Verses six, seven, and eight of this passage cite Psalm eight, four through six. The Psalm praises God for using his creation, his human beings, to rule the earth instead of ruling it directly. The main point being made in this Psalm is that people are given great value by God even though we really don't deserve it. And not only are we valued, we are also given power and authority, which likewise we do not deserve. We are sinners, yet God has a special place for us in ruling his kingdom. The writer of Hebrews is applying this idea to Jesus. God created mankind, gave them power and authority despite their sin. This means becoming a human is not beneath God. And Messiah taking on a human form fits the destiny of man. To be in human form but have authority in creation. This verse in particular hinges heavily on the psalmist's use of the term son of God, which the Jewish people associated with the promised one. What does that mean? It means that God in his created order created us in his image so that we would be vice regents Adele just looked at me, what does that mean? That we would be his co-rulers on this earth. Now we are not little gods, we are, we are not walking around 
you know, naming and claiming things and they're, they're taking place, but God has given us the power and authority to preach the gospel and to watch his kingdom grow, to love people unconditionally the way he loves us unconditionally and watch the kingdom advance. But you can't do that unless you understand who the king of kings is. And if you zero in on verse nine, we see that Jesus was crowned with glory and honor. Jesus was crowned with glory and honor, not us. He was the promised one. And he didn't come as a, as a sturdy, eight foot tall, Shaquille O'Neal ripped, powerful presence. He came as a lowly servant as prophesied by Isaiah. And then he died. He suffered. It says here he suffered death so that the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He suffered for you. He suffered for me. His suffering was not in vain. His suffering wasn't just for suffering's sake. His suffering was producing something. His suffering was foundational. Without his suffering, without his body going to the cross, without his blood being spilled, we would have no forgiveness. And so today, if you're suffering, I wanna let you know that your suffering is not in vain. If you are in Christ, your suffering is not in vain. And I get it, man, when you're suffering, it's hard, to, it's, it's hard to process that. When you're suffering, it's hard to see anything but your suffering, amen? But God is calling us to a greater joy in the midst of our suffering. I'm gonna share a quick story that happened on Thursday night. <clears throat> My son Josh runs the 3200 in track. For, for those of you that don't know what that is, that's eight times around the lap, otherwise known as two miles. And Josh is pretty good. He's in ninth grade, and so he's, I think he finished fifth, right? There's one kid who every race, man, he is like way ahead of everybody else. And every time this kid came around the track, I saw this woman grab her camera and follow him around and root him on, and she was root, it's your race, run for Jesus, run for Jesus. And then it struck me about the third time around, she just kept telling him, enjoy it. Enjoy it, Adam, that's his name. Enjoy it, Adam. Enjoy this race, it's your race. God created you for this. Enjoy this race. And he won, and he won by a lot. And I stood at the finish line as he crossed the finish line. You know the very first thing he said was? I was cramping the whole time. Any of y'all ever had a runner's cramp? Nobody in here runs. Okay, Jade, Jade's had a runner cramp. John's had a runner's cramp. Okay, I haven't had one. <laughs> I hate running. Running cramps my style. That's my runner's cramp. <laughs> but I imagine that it really hurts. And I imagine running around a track eight times with a runner's cramp would be very painful. Meanwhile, his mom's looking on and saying, enjoy this. You're created for this. Run for Jesus. And so I just wanna stop and pause and just tell you if you're suffering here today or that your future suffering in Christ is not in vain. In the same way that Adam, who won that race by a long shot, had a cramp in his abdomen or legs, wherever it was, and his mom is calling out to him to enjoy it, I believe God the Father is looking on us today and saying, enjoy your life in the midst of suffering because I will not waste this. Whatever race you're running, no matter how cramped you feel, if God is with you, he's going to turn it for ultimate glory. And it may hurt. It may cost you your life. The way God advances his kingdom primarily in scriptures is through people's suffering. So, on our best day, we still need a rescuer. We, we, we'll never have what it takes to kind of rescue us from our drift. So I wanna, I wanna, I wanna show you guys uh, 
a two minute video about Aldi. And I want you to pay attention and look for some like restorative biblical themes because we are all desperate sinners who need to be rescued because each one of us is drifting. So if we have the video and the audio, which I really hope we do, if not, I'm gonna be super bummed out. Do we have this ready? Audio's good? All right, let's show this video. Look, when, when, you, when you watch the Good Morning America clip of this, they're not telling you any of this stuff. They're not telling you about a young man who was suffering sharks beating at his raft and the only thing he had was the word of God. All these desperations for the Lord and the drift reminds me of one great thing. The Lord never left him. The Lord never left him. All we had to open his word to receive the blessing of God, to understand the presence of God in his life. Praise God he had a Bible. Like if you're gonna be stranded on a fishing trap hut for 49 days without this, like this is probably the only thing that saved him. He was dependent on the word, worship, and prayer. There, there's something about this story that's truly significant and missed out on is that, I mean, we can't even fathom 49 days in isolation. I've been at sea for 49 days, maybe Adele has too, but 49 days in isolation with no understanding of where you are or if you will be rescued. He traveled 12,000 miles, 49 days. He drifted from Indonesia to Guam. It's a long way. The Lord, he cried out to the Lord for deliverance. And the Lord sent a boat. How powerful is it that God would use us, sinful people, as his agents of his grace? Guys, we, the church, are like that boat. We are called by God to help rescue those who have gone adrift in life, those who have followed the course of the world, to share the only hope that is possible of bringing them freedom from the drift, the hope of Jesus Christ, the life, death, burial, and resurrection, that Jesus Christ died for their sin and in him they can be forgiven. And that's for those outside the church, but it's also for those within the church too. When's the last time in your missional community or in your home you experienced a bout of anger, absence, apathy, or anxiety. There's a tendency in our culture, we live in a cancel culture, right? If you say something wrong or you did something bad 30 years ago, you're done. And so don't, don't offend me, because if you do, you're done. And the Bible says, listen, Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. Instead of turning our backs on people who display fits of anger or rage or absence or apathy towards us, we press in more. The Bible says we bear their burdens. We come alongside them and point them back to Jesus. This is hard work, church. We need to, we need to trust in Jesus for this work. So the only solution to drifting can be summed up in one word, abide. Everybody say abide. I'm trying to make sure people are still awake. Abide. When we think of abiding in Jesus, it's important for us to remember our identity, who we are in Jesus. In doing so, we must remember who Jesus is. And there's something powerful when you read through the Gospels and just watch the way Jesus moved through the world. He had a certain confidence in knowing who he was and where he was returning. That helped him stay tethered to the mission. He knew who he was and where he was going. And therefore, for us, it helps us to know to whom we belong and to whom we will return. I believe the reason many of us go adrift is because we've, we've traded the riches of heaven for the, the scum of the earth. We're too consumed with our creature comforts than we are with the eternal glory of God. And so your identity is not in your stuff. It's not in your, your situation. It's not in your relationships. Your identity is in Jesus. And it will do well for our souls to remember who we are in God. And I'm gonna end with this story. In calling us to abide, I'm calling us to remember our identity. I heard a story recently of a young pastor who was visiting an old man who was senile, basically. He was suffering from dementia and a bunch of other 
diseases and sickness in an old folks home. And this young pastor went and he reminded him of this truth. Hey, brother so-and-so, man, you just need to remember who you are in Jesus. Remember of God's faithfulness and his promises. And the old man looked to the young pastor and he said, the beauty of my relationship with Christ is even when I forget him, he still remembers me. Even when I forget him, he still remembers me. Church, this is the powerful truth of the abiding love of God is that even when we go adrift, God's spirit never goes adrift in us. He will never forsake us, he will never leave us, and he will abide in us and through us. Let's pray. God, there's too much in this world competing for the attention and affections of you. And so, Lord, I pray, whether it's the story of Aldi or something through this sermon, that you would help your beloved bride grow in the image and likeness of Jesus, that you would refine us, that you would remind us that this world and the things it has to offer is perishing, it's passing away. And we have a better king and a better kingdom that we get to be a part of. Help us, Jesus, as, as the song says, our hearts are prone to wander. Help tether us to you, Lord. Lord, it starts with me. I know other brothers and sisters here are struggling, suffering. God, would you remind them that in the midst of their suffering, Lord, to abide and trust in you. You are advancing your kingdom through us, Lord. Lord, I pray that as the culture that we live in wants to destroy the witness of the church, wants to silence us and mask us, Lord, so that we won't share the gospel, that we'll, they'll cancel us, Lord, if we don't do what they say, Lord, that we would remember that this earth is not our home, that you're coming back, and you're coming to make all things new. And so may we be about the Father's business by remembering who we are whom we belong to, and to whom we will return. Help us fight the drift for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.